uh, I want to make a couple introductions and uh, just introduce you guys to the people who, who make it happen. Um, first of all, internally, uh, to my left over here is uh, Jill Taylor. And uh, Jill works uh, with both the maintenance and restoration departments here at FHCAM and is involved in an amazing amount of coordination, which we'll get into uh, in detail uh, here in a little bit, the, the coordinating it takes to put something like this together. And next to Jill is uh, Greg Heitz. He's our uh, lead aircraft technician here. And uh, he, indeed, he, he not only uh, coordinates this restoration here on the floor, uh, but also uh, maintenance of all the aircraft here, uh, which we have 14 flyable and, and several non-flyable, which also need attention. Um, and then uh, next, right here in the in the front row, which we'll get to meet a little bit uh, later, a few of them for the Q&A are uh, all of the talented uh, technicians uh, from IAMF, uh, run by uh, Carl Bershak on the on the end there. So if you guys would just stand up so that everybody can can see who you are. Don't be shy. I know this is uh, on an airplane. But these guys right here. Are the these guys are responsible for uh, what you see uh, behind me here. So like I said, we'll answer questions at the end. Um, I'm going to go through and cover uh, uh, what we started with. Uh, Todd has shown you recovery photos uh, from, from this aircraft, but it, it takes a lot more. Uh, you need more than one project. You can't simply collect Stuka parts your whole life and, and uh, expect to go build a flyable airplane. And you can't just find one project here and say, wow, I've got a, a Stuka project with a data plate. I'm going to go build a flyable Stuka. There's just no chance. It, it takes so much more than that. And um, that's, what, that's what we had to do before we even began to consider restoring this to flyable condition. Um, one kind of interesting thing is uh, with a unique restoration like this, and, and Carl might be able to speak a little bit uh, closer to this, I kind of estimate that you need like a five to one ratio on components. So whatever it is you're trying to build, it's like on average you need five of them to make one operable because not all those parts survive. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, corrosion and rust that goes on inside to the point that the part's not usable. And if you have five, maybe you can build one. And that's sort of, uh, you know, and that scale goes up and down uh, depending on what you're talking about. But um, basically that, that's kind of what you're looking at. Um, these are just some shots of uh, 6234. I think Todd maybe showed these as well. Um, so we start collecting. We collect airframes. We collect a JU87R4. We collect an R2. And uh, what would be maybe half of a B2. All, all the same model of Stuka. All kind of early model Stukas. Um, so we've got these large sections of aircraft. That's the wing of 6234, you can tell by the desert, uh, desert 10 there, and the tail of 6234. So we've, we've got a, a good amount of, of airframes and structure. Well, it takes a lot more than that because a lot of this stuff is either corroded away or missing or buried in the dirt. So you need to buy parts. So we buy collections, people that have been collecting their whole lives and come to the realization of what I've just shared with you is that you can't collect parts your whole life and expect to build a Stuka, a flyable Stuka. And um, so they want to contribute to our project because they know that we have what it takes to get there. Um, so we buy these collections. This is like maybe one pallet load uh, of parts. And from this particular collection, we had uh, maybe like 20, 25 pallets full of parts, Stuka bits and parts. And that's only one of the collections that we've acquired to make this possible. You have to have engines. We collected engines all over the world. Tons of engines, probably a total of, of 10 engines. Engine parts. We probably have 15 pallet loads of engine parts. Not the engines themselves, but the, the fuel rails and the hydraulic pumps and the prop governors and lines and exhaust stacks and everything that goes with the engine because when you recover these engines, a lot of times they've either been wrecked and so they're not all there, 
or uh, schools have had them and they've taken them apart or made cutaways out of them, which is a great example for a school, but absolutely causes us rebuilders and restorers to tremble and cry. <laughs> but it might have some good pieces to it and it might have the, the missing link, which is what you strive for. You're constantly looking for the missing links when you do a restoration this unique. We need propellers. It's not going to go any, anywhere without a propeller. So we start collecting propellers and we wound up with uh, three original propeller blades and uh, probably about five different hubs, which are really unique. Uh, but as you can see, the hubs are not in good shape. Uh, the blades are not usable. Uh, they're wooden blades with a laminate on the top. So, um, you know, over time, they're, they're just not serviceable anymore. So you have to build new. But what's that look like? When you only have a photograph to go off of, that doesn't quite cut it. You need an actual blade to copy. Uh, so that's what we do. Uh, and then probably most importantly, it's good that we have the physical parts and pieces and props and engines and airframes, but there's so much more to it. As Carl will be able to explain, you need data, you need manuals, and you need photographs, and you need to know exactly how large a bell crank was or what size bolt went through this unit and if that unit doesn't exist or you don't have it with your with your project then how, how do you do that where do you get those answers you have to collect data so we set out uh, and collected as much data as we could possibly get we'll dive a little bit deeper into all this as we go on um, but we got data we got photographs of other airplanes we got photographs in books uh, we had 3D scans, an amazing amount of, of, I'm not a computer person, so mega kilo, ginormous bytes, <laughs> tons of it, worth of 3D scans, drawings, manuals, you name it. Um, this was a very uh, difficult process to obtain this data because in the world, there's only two complete stukas remaining. There's, there's wrecks and there's parts of stukas, but there's only two complete examples in the world. And only one of those two are an early model, uh, like an R2 or a B2. The other one's a late model. And it's very different. It's like uh, the difference between a, a Razorback P51 Mustang and a Bubble Canopy P51 Mustang. The airframes are very different, the internal parts are different, the hydraulic actuators and lines are different. It's a, it's a different animal. And we couldn't expect Carl to build a B model Stuka off of a late model. So we had to, we had to find an early model Stuka, um, which we did. However, it was hanging from the ceiling in Chicago in the Museum of Science and Industry. So it wasn't very accessible. We'll get deeper into that as well. Um, it's the only Stuka in the world, the same model as ours. Um, so, here we are uh, several years ago and we decide, let's build this airplane. We've got the data, we've got the airframes, we've got three and a half airplanes, ten engines, five propellers, a ton of data, photos, manuals, and we're ready to go. But what's first? Where do you start with something like that? And, uh, well, I start by sending it to Carl and asking him to work his magic. <laughs> so, uh, what I can say about what it takes to build a flyable airplane that, that hasn't been flown since World War II, that there's only two examples of that are not very accessible, both in museums. My answer to that is that it takes a global village. There's a ton of tribal knowledge and skills and expertise and, and world-leading experts in a variety of different topics that are all going to be needed to make this project come back to life, to bring 6234, our Stuka, back to life. So, here's a, a quick look at our, our global village. Uh, the first star is, is us here in, in Everett, Washington, so everything is based around the Seattle area here. And then we send the airframes over to uh, IAMF in Hungary. We use scan data from a, a, a great company, Neomec, and they're in uh, Batavia, Illinois. Uh, we make arrangements with the uh, Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. 
uh, we go to Vintage Aero Engines, who uh, a lot of you are familiar with and, and we'll get into later, and they're in Tehachapi, California. Uh, the propeller, the blades are built by Hoffman in uh, Germany, and they, they build several uh, propellers around the world for, for all kinds of aircraft. Uh, the main propeller project is handled by Skycraft in the UK. We head down to New Zealand, because we want to be fair, so we'll go way south. And uh, we use Replicor to do our coolers. And uh, they're the world leading experts, uh, I feel, in very unique uh, coolers, whether it's an oil cooler or a radiator, uh, of which we have one of each in the JU87 Stuka. Exhaust stacks will be done by Specialized Welding, the same company that built the unique stacks for our de Havilland Mosquito Airplane in the next hangar over. So we know that they're well versed in doing that and exotic tool welding who finished the exhaust stacks. So it was kind of a, a dual effort there. Um, we have SunQuest who's local uh, right here on Payne Field. And uh, they're gonna do all of our painting, all of our final painting, uh, once we get the paint scheme and, and order in process. And uh, lastly, uh, you have our staff. Uh, so you have Todd and myself and Corey Graff, our curator, uh, doing research and traveling and uh, going to different museums around the world to take photographs and communicate via email to find out uh, not just the history but um, something simple like hey on the landing gear what what kind of a nut holds the axle on well there's only one way to find out since we don't have a photo we got to travel you know across the pond and ask a museum can we go we go look at that nut per se so um, basically what we had to do is just choose the world's leading experts and then figure out a way to coordinate all of that to bring it all together. So here we are, we've got our plan. And so we'll dive in a little bit to uh, kind of some of the unique things that, that each, each uh, uh, player contributed to our restoration. Uh, Museum of Science and Industry uh, was willing to make arrangements with us to access the airplane. The airplane hadn't been down in, in decades. And uh, we, uh, we were able to, to accomplish that, and that was a huge boost. That gave us a ton of answers that uh, were literally hanging in their museum that uh, happened to be the only place in the world we could get those answers. And so um, I love this shot. It's, it's the airplane, uh, you know, and it's in a, in a real museum. And they had everything in this museum. And it was so unique. Uh, my favorite thing, I spent about three weeks there uh, gathering the scan data, taking photos. They were nice enough to let us take the aircraft apart. Uh, gave us an area to work. Uh, set it down on the floor let us disassemble the aircraft to get inside, to look at every component, to get scan data, to make drawings, uh, to gain that information. And, uh, you know, nobody can work solid, so. Uh, and, we, and we worked in shifts, and they didn't want us out on the public floor uh, while they were open, so we came in at night, and we worked um, crazy shifts at night. And, uh, you know, you take a break, you take a lunch break, or you have to eat, and you walk around, and they've got just so much uh, amazing content in the museum. They've got a space shuttle in the museum. And they've got tractors and they have a German U-boat. And they also have incubators where they track chicken eggs and you can follow a chicken egg's life and watch it be born. And I thought, wow, isn't this funny? It's, it, I'm here in Chicago at two o'clock in the morning examining a, a one of a kind, only one in the world German dive bomber and I'm watching a chicken peck its way out of an egg. <laughs> a little bit different, but uh, it's, it's just one example of kind of just the fun things that, you, that happen while you're uh, putting together a project like this. Um, this airplane had, had uh, uh, very important pieces. This is the radiator. Uh, there, there are no early model JU-87 radiators in existence. Um, or the fins, so it had, uh, it had cooling fins in front of the radiator that you could open or close, and it had exit doors, much like the, uh, the P-40 uh, behind the radiator, and it, it used both systems. But what did those fins look like? What were they made out of? What were the dimensions? Those were all things that we didn't know because none existed, uh, just due to the nature of the airplane. You know, it was a nose-heavy dive bomber, so 
uh, the biggest mysteries were all in the front end because a lot of times that part of the airplane didn't survive. We got access to that. Um, we got access to the trapeze on the belly of the airplane that holds the, uh, the large 500 kilogram bomb here. And we just took hundreds of, of measurements of bell cranks. What's the distance between the attaching hole and the actuating rod hole? And uh, we were able to just gain all of that information. Took hundreds of measurements. Neo Mech took, took uh, whatever that word was I said earlier, of scans, all that data. And they scanned everything. They had a, a scanning station. Uh, you can see here, this is the top cowling. Um, we didn't have a top cowling. We didn't have a nose, per se, at all. So uh, we had very, very little to go off of there. Um, we set up a, a scanning station, and uh, we would just rotate the parts we were interested in having scanned through. And whatever we put on their table, they scanned, documented, and, and held for us. Um, here is the uh, kind of interesting note on the table uh, behind uh, Jim there in the photo is the, the box that Todd was talking about earlier. Uh, that the pilot would look through. Basically, if you look through your knees, uh, this box with that long rod sticking out of it uh, comes up by your uh, left knee, and uh, it, it uh, had a door. The window was on the top side of the box, and it had a door down there to, to protect all the oil and dirt, and you just uh, twist the valve, and the door opens, and then you can see out. And uh, we knew that that box was there. It's in the books, it's in the drawings, and and everybody knows about it, but you know, what's it look like? How big is it? How, how does it work? How, how does it actuate? Um, these are all questions that Carl needed answered and uh, that we were able to get. Again, with the uh, radiator cooling fans, uh, we were able to scan that. Uh, we also scanned the entire aircraft all together uh, and with the fairings off. So um, if you note in this photo, uh, the white strings, that's just exactly what they are. They're just thin ropes and strings. And we very uh, carefully ran those to the, uh, the critical uh, structural components on, on the wing. So um, the, uh, the set of two lines are the, the wing longerons. So when we scan that, uh, it, it will then show the exact uh, location of the longer, long or uh, sorry, wing spars rather, not longerons. Um, on the wing and where that's at in relation to the rest of the wing. And then um, uh, the crossways ropes are the main wing ribs. So when we open this back up afterwards, or if you've, you've had a look at the wings there, you'll notice that there's uh, large panels that are open. And that's because uh, Yunkers was, was really, uh, really good at uh, having a minimal type structure that, that was strong enough to hold the support. So in the wing, uh, you have the end rib, you have, you have two spars that run the length of the wing, which are, are not easy, they're very complicated, and um, basically four wing ribs. In, in another airplane, like the P-51, you'll have a, a wing rib every, uh, sometimes foot, maybe every foot and a half or two feet, depending on where they wanted the strength. Well, the Germans, they just had four wing ribs, two spars, and the rest of it, uh, the strength was uh, made up inside uh, the, the skins. As they put the skins on, there were kind of these hat stock uh, supports there. So very unique. And how do you tie that all together? And everybody, uh, if you had a structural manual, which we do, um, you would see that that was the case. Wow, we've got two wing spars and, and four ribs, but how do we make that happen? And if the wing skins are supported by a structure, then how do you make them smooth? And, and how do they attach the spars? A lot of questions. And where exactly are those going to be? If we're gonna make jigs to build the wings, these are all answers that Carl needed to have. Um, and uh, I'll show you an example of that uh, with our 6234 airplane as IAMF was putting it together. Um, this is an example of how the technology uh, helped out during the restoration. Uh, Carl had requested, uh, hey, we need a scan of the wing, of the import part of the wing. So uh, I contact the scan company and they send this over and Carl sends it back saying, please remove this fairing. So I send it to the scan guy and he takes that fairing off and then we get the dimensions we need for whatever it is Carl's after. So there's a lot of coordination, a lot of coordination. Um, 
And then uh, what was nice is that we wound up with a, a full uh, detailed scan of a JU87. This is an R2 uh, Stuka. Um, so next we'll talk about IAMF and uh, uh, Carl and his talented crew over in, in Hungary. We've got uh, all of the, the data in, in one place and we've got it all over at, at uh, in Herrick there for Carl to get going. So um, we're going to travel with, with the project. We've sent our airframes 5,500 miles from the Seattle area here over to Hungary and all of the data. And uh, so this is what the beginning of the speaker project looks like. This is the center section that you see here behind me. These are the main supports here. And so inside this area is what you're looking at there. And that's what we start with. That's it again, but uh, built into a box. And uh, Carl decided it was best to start with the fuselage tail section because uh, it's kind of the heart and the, and the most, uh, uh, I, I guess, the most critical or important is is the uh, center section, the fuselage here. This is where all the strength is. This is where the landing gear sits. This is where the the wing spars attach. Uh, this is kind of the heart and soul of the airplane. And so that's what we attacked first. It's also the most complicated. You have more action going on in and around the pilot seat in the cockpit than you do anywhere else in the airplane. Once you get out into the wings, it gets a little more simple. Uh, this is looking down the tail section here. Uh, if you notice uh, the little yellow, I don't know if you can pick up the color, but uh, there's a handful of, of yellow uh, support brackets in there, and, and that yellow anodize um, our original J87 parts. So anything that we had with our airframes that was reusable and structurally sound we incorporated back in this airplane. A lot of the electrical components, the, the switches, the circuit breakers, the uh, plugs, um, some of the tubing, anything that was good, we put back in. And that that's deliberately to meet our, our exacting restoration standards. At Flying Heritage, we restore airplanes to, to a higher standard than, than most, than to other museums, to other collectors. Um, and it, as, as the uh, restoration manager, I have to answer the question a lot or, or uh, derail restorers who say, well, you know, it would be a lot easier if we installed one of these. Or I know that this was original, but you're going to have to replace this in half the time as you normally would. And the answer is always, we're going to put it back the way it was originally. We're not, we're not restoring the airplane to be easier to use or to last longer. We're restoring the aircraft to be exactly the way it was during World War II to the best of our ability. And one of the things we do there is we include the original parts. Uh, there's a nice shot uh, looking forward. Uh, so that's kind of the, the tail section looking forward. And from the side again, and, and there's an incredible amount of, of stringers is what those are called. Um, Talk about the, a global effort. Carl gets to a point in the project, this point here, and we need uh, the longerons, which are the main support uh, beams basically for the fuselage. Uh, but the problem is they're extremely long. And uh, Carl has a hard time finding a, a machine large enough to bend the parts that we need. And so we start kind of a, a literally a, a global hunt for a press break long enough to bend our longerons to put in the stuka, and all he needs is the basic shape, and then he takes over from there and, and makes them the stuka shape that they need to be uh, with the contours. So uh, the result of that was we found a company right here in downtown Seattle who uh, makes just specialty items, shipping containers, uh, trash bins, anything and everything, and they've got two 20-foot press brakes hooked together so they can make 40-foot shipping containers and Stuka Longerons. <laughs> 5,500 miles back this way, we get the material. 5,500 miles that way, Carl has his Longerons, and then he works his magic and makes them fit into this structure you see right here. <coughs> Another shot of the, the boys connecting, I think, maybe the tail section up to the uh, uh, center section spar there. 
Uh, one thing you can kind of see a little bit here is uh, that, that Yunkers, uh, they design things in halves for production reasons. And the Stuka was designed in a top half, bottom half, which is not kind of typical. So they built the top half in one room and they built the bottom half in another room. And uh, then they would just put them together. Uh, we didn't have that luxury because we don't have the original tooling. So we had to build the whole thing and make it removable and then finish up. And uh, I'll show you some examples of that as well. Uh, so this is the, the entire fuselage coming together, but you can see really clearly where the top half ends and the bottom half begins there. Another good shot right here and where it all kind of came together nicely. Um, the next slide uh, that I'm going to show you is uh, proof that Stuka restorations do in fact cause gray hair because my hair is not that dark anymore. <laughs> and this wasn't that long ago. And I won't mention anything about Carl, but you'll get to see him later and you'll think of this slide. So there's a picture of the top half. Once Carl and the boys got, got the fuselage all together and complete, they removed the top half so that they could finish the bottom half. And there's a nice shot uh, just looking from the firewall uh, aft and uh, you can see all of the, kind of the yellow anodize there. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, but just note uh, how much yellow anodize is in here. All these parts are, are that yellow color. Uh, there's a good shot of the bottom without the top half on while they wrap it up there. And there it comes all back together again. So we're done with the fuselage. We move on to the wings. These are the, the wing spars, which were not easy to build. They were pretty complex. This is the jig for putting them together. And in the background there, you can see the, the wing skin stiffeners. They're, they're kind of curved for the uh, airfoil shape and the skins will get attached to those. So it, in this shot here, you can see the two wing spars and where the yellow sections are, are the ribs. So those are the main ribs. You see they have some corrugation there. And, and that's the heart and soul. The rest of the small pieces there are the, the stiffeners for the wing skins, so that's all removable. But if you were to take all the skins off of a JU-87 wing, you would be left with the two wing spars and the four vertical ribs that are there. And so, um, back to the color. So the, the yellow uh, anodizing you see on the skins in the ribs there, and you can see a little bit of it inside the uh, fuselage here. And if you guys look straight across, at the R2 wing, you'll notice from this side, you can see the yellow inside the wing, all that internal yellow. And uh, that's anodizing. So you make an aluminum part and it's, it's aluminum. Then you send it out to have it anodized, which uh, protects it, protects it from the elements and from corrosion. Uh, you, you essentially don't need to paint after that. The Germans didn't. They left things anodized because that was enough protection for them. And at that time, uh, you know, militaries around the world didn't expect the aircraft to last very long anyway, so this was more than enough. Um, so how do we anodize this yellow color? So we look for companies to anodize uh, aluminum, and they have standard colors, but none of them are World War II Yonkers JU-87 yellow. So what Carl does, because he knows our restoration standards at Flying Heritage. He contacts a company and somehow amazingly finagles them to mix a special batch, tested it, matched it from an internal part that had been hidden from the elements so he knew exactly what color it was. So all the yellow anodized you see here is a custom matched color and all of our parts were anodized back to the original German World War II color. And nobody else in the world will ever have that because, you know, the anodize is gone now. We're done anodizing those parts and now they're back to their standard colors. So something you'll only see right here. Uh, there's the wing. It's continuing to come together there. Uh, you can see ribs and, and they're starting to fit skins on in this shot here. And uh, starting to get towards the end, a lot of Clecos, as you could imagine. There's a left wing complete with the tip being fit. You can see the spars there and uh, everywhere uh, that those uh, kind of cross members or structures are is where the wing skin panels basically get put on. 
and there's the completed set of wings. They fit it all together, and, uh, and they fit perfectly. So there's the JU-87 in, in Herrick, Hungary, uh, with the wings installed. So, uh, not only not only are, are they working on the, the airframe structure, but everything else that goes inside of it and around it, uh, there's a lot of components. There's uh, fuel system components and oil tanks and oil system components. And, and these are things that uh, Carl and his, and his uh, group are working on. Um, and this particular piece here, uh, uh, you can see the exhaust stack, and below that is this, uh, uh, well, it's the casting that, that holds the cooling fins on that go behind the radiator. And that casting doesn't exist, and that's not a part that uh, was included or that was owned by the Museum of Science and Industry. They didn't have that piece, and so I didn't have access to it. So what Carl had to work with was uh, maybe 20% of that part, I would say. It was just a chunk of it, just on one side. And as you can see, it's dynamic. It gets thicker in areas and thinner, and it's not the same on the left side as it is the right side. And it's a huge, uh, uh, hugely important piece because it actuates the cooling flaps. And um, what they had to do was to reverse engineer that. They knew certain points. They knew what the engine mounts looked like. They knew what the exhaust stacks looked like and what held those on and everything around it. And basically with that and drawings had to be very clever and reverse engineer exactly what that part would look like. They knew what, they knew what the, uh, the doors look like that connected to it, and they knew the rods, we had that information, but the actual casting, we didn't. Um, he was able to sort all that out and solve that mystery on his own in his shop and, uh, and wound up building the part. And I think that's just a great example of, of the, the length these guys went to, to to build this airplane you guys see here. Um, the other thing that a lot of people don't don't get that, that I just want to want to display is how big this airplane is. It it's deceivingly uh, thin. You know the tail is is kind of nice and dainty looking. Of course, it doesn't have the horizontal on it yet, uh, and was kind of the weak point of the air, aircraft. Honestly, kind of right where the step is there, and uh, you know it's sitting low here, and the and the wings are kind of hidden back there. But it's a large aircraft, and it sits very tall. The landing gear was fixed. Um, and there wasn't much compression. So the length of the landing gear is basically what stayed. There was a spring system inside of it. It was not an oleo like uh, a lot of the, the American or British airplanes where you, you know, the, the gear is really long and then you set it down and it gets shorter. The Stuka wasn't like that. It had springs inside. We have some of those springs over on the table. And uh, basically they just stacked these springs and they would compress just given the weight, but it wasn't very much. So the landing gear height is what it is. And the airplane sat very tall. It was a really large airplane. So when uh, Carl and Javi, who's here today, got everything together with the, the, the wheel pants or the spats, which you know give it that real bird of prey look and that kind of ominous, notorious, stupid look, um, we took a picture of it standing up. And there you can see Javi next to it and just how high it would be. So basically, um, right at the top there, that's what goes inside here. So when we put this airplane together, you're going to see this point of the aircraft, you know, at about eye level. And then you add the engine and the canopy and the propeller. You can imagine how big this airplane is going to be and what a presence it's going to have. It's going to be really, really neat to, to get it all together. And by the way, that, that curve of, of this wheel pan here, that's, that's not an easy task. So here's the airplane all, all together and, uh, and in the hangar uh, up to this point. Uh, Carl and the guys are still working on systems and getting some of those over here and installing those. But basically the structure is complete in here. So let's, uh, let's move on to, to engines. We're going to go uh, 9,770 miles the other direction to California, a little town called the Hatchapi to get a very unique Yumo 211J engine. And uh, we're taking all of our parts and, and we've given those to Mike Nixon down there. A lot of you are familiar with Mike Nixon. He 
He built the uh, world's only operable BMW 801 engine, which is on our Focke 190. Uh, he's done the engine for the uh, ME 109. He's, he's done a lot of exotic uh, German engines, so he's a natural choice, um, and he does a good job. Um, he's, he and his companies have built several of the engines uh, in the hangar, but those are probably the most notable ones. Um, here he's, he's got the uh, engine case together. Uh, the challenging part that, that he ran into that we didn't realize was uh, the difference in the model numbers and uh, the difference between an F and a J or an A or an H, UMO 211, is, is pretty great. There's a lot of differences and not all the parts from the H model will fit into the J model that we're trying to build. So we had 10 engines and several pallets, but not all of it translated to what we were trying to do. And, and that was sort of a, um, it, that was sort of in the spirit of, of how Germany was operating at that time. Um, Carl and I were having a conversation uh, just a couple days ago and he was saying even the, the JU87s, even though it's an R4, one R4 is not gonna be the same as the next because they found things they could improve on and they changed things inside the factory all the time, they were constantly improving and making things better. So uh, JU88 is not a JU88 is a JU88. It doesn't work that way, and it's the same same problem we've been finding with our our uh, UMO engines we're having built elsewhere for the ME262. The Germans were just very progressive and constantly changing, and that plays a, a huge role in, in building the UMO211 uh, for the Stuka here. Uh, some original parts, again, if, if, if we can find an original part and use it, we're going to do that. In the case of the engine, uh, most of them have to be original just because of the nature of the beast there. Um, pretty soon, uh, as you can see, this engine is about ready to run. Um, we're hoping that it'll run this month and it'll be the first operable UMO 211 since, since World War II. And that'll be a pretty neat feat to just be able to say that much less get it here and stick it on this airplane and put it together with the world's only Yonkers VS-11 propeller that's been operable since World War II and, uh, and make that go. But you can't run it without exhaust stacks. So we're going to head 6,500 miles south again to New Zealand and uh, employ specialized welding who made our mosquito stacks to build GU-87 exhaust stacks. We have examples, so it's easy to get the scan data. Uh, we know how they were welded, the thickness. Um, we know what alloy we want to make it out of, and uh, so he develops tooling, and you can see the first, second, and then final try at it. Uh, so there's a lot of effort put into the exhaust stacks. Um, we finally got all the pressings made here, and uh, uh, put together in kits, and then we send those pressings 7,000 miles north to Everett, Washington to get welded up and put the final touches on. Uh, final touches being the Yonkers emblem that was uh, welded onto the exhaust stack. Uh, we certainly couldn't just have an exhaust stack without the Yonkers emblem because those are the standards flying heritage resource airplanes too. So these three stacks are actually just right over there on that table. You can uh, have a look at those and, and uh, see, see what we started with and what we wound up with. And uh, hopefully, you know, just over a year from now, they'll be turning a different color than that. There's the stacks all together. That's the glory shot. I just, just like the way that looks, so I threw that in there. So uh, now that we're here in Everett with uh, exhaust stacks ready to go on the engine, let's, let's go 5,000 miles across the pond again to the UK where they're building our propeller. So uh, Skycraft, uh, they've, they've got a, a pretty, pretty good reputation. They've done a lot of propellers. They've done a lot of propellers um, for our museum specifically. Um, they know what it takes to get the propellers together to get them working. They've done an amazing amount of Spitfire propellers. Uh, they start with uh, the same kind of uh, scrap hubs and have to rebuild everything. Um, this is an oil pump that goes in the front of the hub. 
It's a really unique propeller the way it operates. Uh, a lot of like, hydraulic propellers that use oil pressure uh, just use engine oil pressure. This takes that engine oil pressure and uh, drives it to a pump inside the propeller hub to then circulate it out to actuate the blades. Um, so, if a propeller system wasn't complicated enough, the Germans will surely find a way to make it more complicated <laughs> because that's how they work. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so here, here's a look at what they what they accomplished, and um, uh, you can see the hub is is a lot nicer looking now. Uh, they've got it together, and I've got a, a short video that I will attempt to play here. This is an original blade they put in the hub just to test the hub. They've got the, the oil pump working and they set a test for it. So you can see that they're able to actuate uh, just by changing the oil pressure and uh, the oil pump in the hub. And there's a propeller blade. That's the first operable Yonkers BS11 propeller since the world of Jesus. right here. Be a lot more menacing sounding than that, I promise. <laughs> so here's a shot of the uh, the blades. The propeller blades were uh, they were made by uh, Hoffman Propeller in Germany, and that's who Skycraft uses to build all their blades. Uh, and and those two as a group, uh, as I've said, they they built um, a lot for our collection. Uh, they built the uh, Focke Wolf 190 propeller. They have built our BF 109 propeller that you see over to the left there and um, our Spitfire propeller as well. Um, to date, they've built over 125 Spitfire propellers. And they're getting to the point now where they're, they have the certification to build a Spitfire propeller uh, from scratch, basically. Um, so they are uh, definitely the world's leading experts on, on building propellers. Um, we had uh, James and Andy from Skycraft. They came over and, and uh, I worked with Greg and I pretty closely to uh, assemble the propeller. We assembled it right here uh, behind me and um, got it together, made sure it worked, set the blade angles, and uh, it was uh, just kind of neat, something to see. They hadn't fully assembled the propeller uh, um, other than the one time in the shop. And what's unique about it is, is one thing they learned and the reason that that we built it here and shipped it together all complete down to uh, to Hatchapi is because when you remove the blades, they, uh, the propeller blade has a cone that sits in there. And, and that cone, by design, it has two weak points. And it's so that you can have a, a, the necessary weak point to get the nut back off if you ever had to change a blade. The issue is the cone breaks every time you take a blade out. So you just have to have spare cones, and then it was by design. Again, it's a German thing, complicated plus. And so it was really critical that when we assembled the propeller, what Greg and I learned, that you had to do it right the first time, because you couldn't back the nut off and take another swing at it. You had to get it right. And that's not something that um, they trusted us with, quite frankly, so they came over to show us that. Uh, so they spent a lot of time here uh, going through the propeller and the operation and, and how that goes. Um, so now we're going to head back south again, another 11,500 miles to New Zealand. And uh, this is an example of the uh, Stuka oil cooler. And we started with a pretty good core, so the oil cooler was not really a big challenge for these guys. Uh, these guys have made repairs on our Falk Wolf uh, 190 oil cooler, which is pretty complicated. You guys know it's, it's round, it goes around the engine. Um, they have built uh, our mosquito radiators from scratch. There's a very talented uh, group of individuals. So, so the oil cooler finished product there was not a, not a really big challenge. But what was a big challenge was the radiator, because this is the, the only remaining other than the one in Chicago, 
radiator for the JU87 uh, early model Stuka like ours is. And as you can see, it's not even a third of it. It's, it's maybe uh, 15, 20 percent of a radiator. And so how, how do you build that? Uh, how do you mount it to the airplane? Uh, how big are the cores? How thick are the how thick are the cores? How far apart are the fins? Uh, how many cores are there? Is it one core um, or not? And those are all questions that we were able to answer through that uh, data that we got from MSI. Um, here's a shot of the tooling that they had to build. So this big uh, kind of complex uh, tooling is just simply to hold the top of the tank down so that they can solder it on. So they don't just build the radiator, they have to build tooling to build the radiator. And the expense these guys go to to make it perfect is, is just incredible. Um, here they're making the uh, plates for the core to go into, uh, machining it all out. Scan data, so uh, to make the, the uh, top plate, they needed scan data. They had questions we went back and forth with. A shot of the plate there, a sample of the core here. It all comes together. There's the, what they call the tank. So the core or, or you know, the, uh, the system that the air passes through one way and the fluid passes the other way goes inside of this tank. What we learned in Chicago that I don't know that anybody knew was that the radiator cores uh, was not one solid core. Most cores are one solid core. Some are several if it's in a funny shape like the like the uh, Bach Wolf 190. It has several sections, I think maybe eight sections that go around. Well, the Stuka is no different. They couldn't make it one solid core, which would have been too easy. They made it in three cores, and they didn't make it square or rectangular or circular. They made it kind of uh, funky, weird, heart-shaped. I don't know why. Maybe they thought it looked cool. But there it is, in thirds. And, uh, and it, it kind of complicates things, and it makes it hard for these guys to shape the core. But, uh, I mean, what a unique, a neat, very unique core they had to put together. Here's a shot of them uh, pressure testing it before they uh, do the final pressure and leak check. And uh, there's the radiator all together, and these are the talented individuals who put it put it together uh, down there in New Zealand. We're very proud. And uh, there you have the the uh, well. It's possible that the Chicago radiator could work and might not leak, but I think I'm going to go ahead and claim that that's the world's only operational or flight ready uh, radiator. We shipped that the 11,000 some odd miles uh, over to Hungary and uh, Carl has the radiator and the oil cooler now to fit it inside the cowling and the brackets. We, you have to know how to attach it. It has to fit around that amazing casting that he, that he uh, machined out. Um, so they, they go from New Zealand by the way, that the piece of core uh, that they had, the piece, chunk of radiator that they had to work with and all that information uh, came from Germany. So we had parts from Germany down to New Zealand, information from Seattle down to New Zealand. They put it all together. Everything gets shipped to Hungary so Carl can fit it inside the cowling and then it'll get shipped back here to, the, to this area to be installed and, and uh, operationally tested. So uh, here we are at, at SunQuest. And uh, they're painting, you'll notice there's a guy on the bottom. They, they painted it simultaneously. The camouflage was, was put on wet. And um, they did that uh, because they were able to get the best results uh, judging on uh, the, the paint that we can see on the recovered aircraft and photographs. And, you know, they did several tests. And the, the way to get the best camouflage line in was to put the tan on wet over the blue. So in other words, they paint the blue, they put the tan right behind it. And it's pretty likely in the factory, if you're gonna have something in the paint booth or in the paint area, why would you wait for something to dry? You were in a hurry, you were building airplanes. You painted the blue, you changed guns, you painted the tan right on top. And so that's exactly what we did. Shot of it inside their paint booth there. And, and these are the guys that, that make that happen. Uh, and it's been these same three guys that have been doing a lot of the painting for Flying Heritage here. Uh, they, they've painted several aircraft in our collection. Um, SunQuest has, uh, they've painted our F6F Hellcat, which sits in this room. Uh, the P-40 
and the IL-2. They painted the Japanese Zero. Uh, they painted the Mosquito pretty recently. And uh, now the JU-87. That's a pretty good, uh, pretty good painter's logbook, I would think. Here's a shot of it after we got it back. And uh, both sides, the colors contrast really nicely. So uh, here we are. There's a nice before and after shot in here. And uh, the project is painted. It's back here. We have uh, Hungarians on site to put systems in. Greg's out here every day picking away at it. And uh, so basically what I'm, what I'm hoping and dreaming for in maybe three to five years is, is this hanger looking like this. <laughs> I haven't told Greg yet, so that's the building game. Yeah, that, that would be something. So the, here we're doing the research, uh, as, as Todd mentioned earlier, uh, with the paint. You know, I, I went to get the, the paint masks, which we know they used uh, evident in photographs like this uh, for the, the cross and the letters. and. Uh, rather than saying, hey, we want this letter and this font out of this modeling book and it needs to be this size, uh, I walk over to the example that I have right there and I say, the yellow F has to be exactly this many millimeters by this many millimeters. And the D that's underneath the, the original factory radio code, uh, it's a slightly different font and I know that because I can see it here on the airplane. And so we need to make it this way. And then uh, the guys at SunQuest, they make the, the paint masks exactly uh, how I request that, so that it's not us guessing, well, the W was this big by this photograph, it's exactly what was on the aircraft because we can see it. And in doing that, we discovered, uh, looking, measuring, that it had a separate identity, which we, uh, as Todd said, we initially knew that the airplane was uh, L1FW, uh, but what we didn't know was that 6234 had, had that other life, and, and how long was it? We're still trying to hash those details out. I think, as Todd mentioned, we're really really starting to pin it down, but um, it wasn't always yellow F, so they would have referred to this airplane as yellow F. And it wasn't always yellow F, it was white C for a while. And, and we have so much amazing history on what yellow F did, and where it flew, and what missions it flew, and we have a, a complete account of what happened the day it got shot down. But what about the White Sea story? What did it do as White Sea? Where did it fly? Who flew it? <coughs> Those are all things that we're going to drive to uh, to learn. And and pretty amazing that that we have uh, this airframe. We're able to see there's a White Sea under there. So that's kind of that's the fun stuff of the restoration. Right? Um, there's a little better close up there. Another thing you'll notice is the uh, uh, the stencil on the right, and you'll see that there. Uh, this nice desert tan. They they didn't bother reapplying any of the stencils. Anything that they wanted to keep that would be useful in the field, they just masked over it, painted it the the uh, Russian uh, camouflage, the the RLM seventy seventy one splinter camouflage for for the north. Uh, and then peeled the tape off, and then there was this desert tan or kind of pink color under it with the stencils that they thought the guys would need. Um, if you look closely on that example over there, uh, you'll be able to see there's some stencils under the paint that they didn't feel like they were going to need anymore. Uh, the red circle around the mooring uh, tube ring, or uh, the paint color that was supposed to go on, or the paint code. Uh, was stenciled on there in the factory, but they didn't bother masking that off. They just painted right over. And so um, it's our intention to do exactly that. Uh, the stencils will we'll paint this aircraft just like it came out of the factory. Uh, hopefully we can nail down that it was TJ and then FD, and that's what you'll see it look like. It's TJ, FD, with all of the factory stencils, all of these stencils you see here. Um, around the mooring hole and on the landing gear uh, where the the uh, medical kit was in this hole right here on the side of the fuselage. All the little bits, uh, where the fuel goes, where the oil goes, uh, what grade those were, all that's going to be done in the factory. And then when we get the airplane together and it rolls out of the factory, so to speak, with its desert paint job and all the stencils, 
we're going to take it to the paint shop and we're going to mask off all the stencils that were masked off and we're going to paint it with the 7071 right over the top of everything and then we're going to make the aircraft then represent uh, what we believe was L1CW and we'll paint that on and then we'll go through the final iteration and cover that up, which they did a lot of times in the field. And so you can see the C was painted over. The C on the wheel pants that will go on the front, I'm sure, was painted over. And then, and then the F will go on after that. You'll notice on the wing panel uh, over here, that's the bottom of the left wing, um, because it had the, uh, the European theater uh, yellow under the wing tips, and uh, under the, they're under the wheel spats as well, and under the fuselage, uh, they went from white C, so there was a white C on the yellow, then they covered that in a different color yellow, and then rather, how do you put a yellow F on a, on a yellow wingtip is the question. Well, they just drew an outline, and it looks like it was hand-painted. Maybe they used masking tape, and then hand-painted the outline in black of an F, and um, we know that because you can see it, it's right there, and that's exactly what we'll do.